<clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Cruz, sitting today in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and our Culture Code guest today is the Chief People Officer of Critio, Manuela Montagnana. Manuela, I want to apologize for butchering your last name, <laughs> and tell us where are you coming to us from today? Um, hi, Kevin. Uh, great to be here. I'm actually talking to you from Paris, uh, where Critio's headquarters are. Um, I am a French-German national living in the United States, so I would consider myself a global citizen, and I'm very excited to be here. So Critio's headquarters is in um, Paris, but how many offices do you have? What are the ma major locations or some of them? So our, um, our footprint is pretty global. So we are a 3,500 employee company um, with over 20 offices. The major ones are in New York, Paris, Barcelona, uh, but we also have presence in Tokyo, in Seoul, um, Singapore, I mean, all over the world. Incredible and presence. Yeah, for that for that size company. And that makes it all the more fascinating to me about, you know, how you scale and sustain culture, you know, over over space, which is what we're going to get into. But for people who aren't familiar uh, with your company, tell us, you know, in your own words, what do you do? Sure. Criteo is a global advertising technology company. So basically our platform connects consumers to the products and services that interest them via tailored advertisement as they browse the internet. So either the open internet or on a retail retailer site. And that is driving sales for the marketers who are doing the advertisement on those sites. That makes sense. And Culture is a funny thing, you know, people have different definitions of it and, and, you know, describe it in different ways. But again, just in a few words, like what is, how would you describe your company culture? What's it like? Or what are you trying to uh, create there? We have actually worked on that. And so we have a pretty clear definition. Our company culture can be resumed in three words. It's open, together, and impactful. And so the idea of open is that we are strong believers in a diverse and inclusive environment. So we want to make sure that our employees are really open to all kinds of ideas, backgrounds, and things that make this organization just as rich as it is because of, by the way, I didn't mention we have over 92 different nationalities. So it's a pretty interesting cultural mix from that perspective. The togetherness is really around collaboration, around achieving things in a way that is making everybody feel part of the bigger. And so together we are achieving this and impactful. Of course, we are not a nonprofit. We want to have an impact and we want to make sure that um, our people understand how their actions you know, reach um, ultimately, not only internally, but also externally, the customers. So clearly, it's very uh, thought through, open, together, impactful, but that doesn't happen by accident. So um, what are some of the ways that you're fostering this culture with especially so many locations around the world? Yeah, so this is, um, it is indeed a unique culture. And I have to say, I joined Criteo um, two years ago, and I was impressed by exactly what you say, like a French company originally, but we are a public company traded at the NASDAQ in the United States. Our leadership team is based mostly in the United States. We have teams all around the world. We have offices all around the world. However, we also have something very unique that is our full flexible work approach, which means that following the pandemic, we were really wondering, are we going to ask people to come back to the office? Like many companies said, you have to be back from Monday to Wednesday, just because, or are we going to say, listen, during this pandemic, you demonstrated that you were able to work in an effective way in a remote setting, why would we not trust you that you know how to do your job best and we give you the choice? We have offices that you can come to. We want you to come back to the office for intentional reasons, you know, not to sit on Zoom calls for eight hours a day, 
where you can actually be more productive when you do that from home. But for team meetings, for internal events, for workshops, for things that really we encourage people to come together on this basis. So I believe that our full flexible work, work approach is definitely one of the most foundational things that we have in our company culture around the fact that we love to bring people together, but not mandate it. You know, we want them to be together. And on the other hand, we also are in a situation where we know that you have to make sure communication flows in a very efficient way. So we have monthly all hands where our CEO, Megan Clarken, is talking to the organization about business updates. We have people who speak about the different projects that are going on. We are doing them on an alternate basis. Either they are Americas friendly, which means they're in the afternoon in Europe, or we are doing them APAC friendly, which means they're in the morning in Europe. And the leadership team is not always in the same place. So we're also demonstrating by how we are ourselves, sometimes remote, some, sometimes in person, you know, that we are living by example, basically, um, how we want this culture to live. So these global all hands are opportunities to connect with our people. We are also always including Q&A sessions. So in advance, we ask people to ask questions. Um, when we are not having enough time at the end of the meeting, which happens sometimes, you know, to go to in, de in depth into the Q&A, we always follow up with written responses so that, again, we can have managers also in their team meetings, you know, reinforce the messages, answer the questions so that it's not perceived as, oh, I was not in New York the day the town hall happened. I was left out but really trying to be inclusive for this global audience. Yeah, that's really impressive because so many, even strong organizations I know, they might do all hands, but a more typical cadence would be a quarterly cadence perhaps. And I often, you know, preach to our clients, the, the, the stronger you want your, your culture and the faster you want to be able to move, the more frequent your, your all hands cadence should be. And so the monthly cadence is, is really impressive. And I like the way you alternate the, the time zones to make it inclusive for, you know, everyone geographically. Hmm. I want to move into the next topic, which when I think about culture, a lot of it is uh, related to, you know, how engaged people are at work, how emotionally committed we are to the goals of our organization. And we know from Gallup research, LeadX research has shown the same thing that about 70% of how we feel about work is tied back to who our manager is. So despite all the great work of the CEO and the mission, vision, values, and all this stuff, if we're reporting to a, a, a weaker manager, it's going to have an impact on our, our engagement, of course. And so thinking about the vital role of frontline managers who are the filter of communication for more you know, souls than anyone else in your organization, Tell me a little bit about how you're developing these managers, these frontline uh, leaders. Hmm. Yeah, Kevin. So first of all, I would totally agree. You know, this old saying about you're not leaving a company, but you're leaving your manager is very true. Um, and so people leadership, especially in tech organizations, is, a, is, is an interesting topic because in many places, it's the greatest tech leader that was promoted to be the first people leader, but it's not necessarily what these great tech leaders really want to do. And so making sure that we are already identifying before we promote people into people leadership roles, if they are actually interested in doing it, I think is a first step that is very important that we do that through um, our talent review processes where my team, the people business partners, are very engaged with the department leaders to make sure they identify who has the potential to become that. Once a people leader is either hired into the organization from the outside or is promoted from within, we have them attend a manager training. We call it the Future Makers Program. And so it is really around how, as a manager, you understand that it is your responsibility to cultivate this great, inclusive, and diverse environment that we believe is going to make us stronger um, at Criteo. It is inclusive of some very day-to-day, -day basic managerial task items, 
but it has also on a six months basis, a one-to-one -one coaching component to it. And we have developed an internal coaching program that we call Coach Me, where we believe actually that it is very relevant that other people managers in the organization who have already gone through the process and who have more experience share and help the more junior ones. And so through coaching, and we have also a, a new mentoring program that's coming up, but it's a different one. Um, we are really confident that you give them the toolbox of how do I have a difficult conversation? How do I give feedback? How do I make sure that performance management is doing well? You know, that's what I call the manager toolbox, but you also give them the leadership keys to the car around how do I deal with engagement in my team? And we are currently reviewing what we call our leadership behaviors, which by the way, we wanna apply to all levels in the organization, because we believe that leadership is not only people leadership. An individual contributor can also have a leader position if they are a thought leader or if they are just you know, recognized as somebody with a lot of credibility around uh, subject matter expertise. And so we want to make sure we have the right expectation set for individual contributors, for frontline leaders, but also for the leaders of leaders you know, where the, the, the higher you are in the organization and the more leaders of leaders you have, you need to make sure that you're also ensuring that what you said earlier, this importance of being an audience, you know, that is transmitting messages and that is a filter and um, an amplifier um, of our strategy is very clear. And well, there's so much great stuff there. And just for listeners, I want to, I just want to, underscore a couple of things. You know, I asked you about how you develop these frontline leaders and you started with and spent some time about leader selection. You know, not everyone should be a, a people manager and, and that's okay. And this is the classic problem, right? So you're a great sales representative and they make you a sales manager. You're a great software engineer. So they make you the lead of a project team of engineers and not everyone wants to do it. They think that's the only way to get a raise or to get status or something, or not everyone, you know, it necessarily has the natural personality for it. And so it starts with selection. And it's so rare for me to hear that. And then the other thing that um, I just love is your idea about, and anyone who's you know read my books, I'm all about everyone's a leader, whether they want to be or not. If leadership is about influence, we influence when we speak up. We influence when we stay silent. We influence with our attitudes. Everyone's a leader. And so to start to think about that and make that part of culture um, it is amazing. And, and I'm going to go off script on something uh, because you talk about using your more senior leaders to coach more less experienced leaders. And I mean, I've worked with a lot of professional service firms, advertising agencies and other, and the big problem is if you, everybody's feeling busy, like we, we're on deadline, we need to hit that client deadline, or we're on billable hours or these kinds of things. And so the number one pushback I hear is, hey, I don't have time for this, like go hire an outside coach for to, to coach my managers, <laughs> or send me the, the, the brief version of the leadership manual, like I just am not going to make time for this. So what's been part of your, you know, secret approach, your secret sauce to make the leaders feel that it's a priority to coach up the next generation. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good point. I mean, you know, clients first, you know, and all these business uh, challenges that, that we all know about. Um, I think that at Criteo, because we have been able to provide them with short modules with you know, like expect we, we are trying to cater to their expectations that it should not be like this overwhelming, oh my God, I got to read a manual of 300 pages and then I have to go through a certification or whatever. We want to make sure we do it right, right? So don't get me wrong, we're not brushing over this. But there is a lot of, um, I think it's more of a collective understanding that we need to invest in the next generation and we hold the senior leaders accountable to the development of the more junior ones. So it is part of our KPIs. It is part of the goal setting process, basically, to say, if you're a more senior leader, it's your responsibility to not only develop your own team, 
but also to give a hand to the Criteo talent overall. And we have experienced actually even stronger and better engagement when it's cross-functional. So let's say when it's a leader in finance who's coaching a leader in sales or somebody in marketing coaching somebody in people, we are also having the parallel benefit of cross-fertilization and better understanding of what the challenges of these other departments are, you know, which in a company is always a topic, you know, like, oh, no, I'm more busy than you are busy and I'm more critical than you are critical. And so I think that that helps as well. Yeah. You, you mentioned, well, you just mentioned some KPIs and earlier you talked about um, Critio gathers, you know, Q&A at the monthly town halls. Uh, what are some other ways you're getting feedback from team members, you know, about culture and their level of employee experience or, or engagement? So we actually set up last year a new listening strategy. I wanted to walk away from the annual survey where you ask 250 questions. It takes you three months to analyze the results. It takes you another two months to go back to the teams. And everybody has, by that time, everybody has forgotten about what they said six months ago. So we are doing a pulsing that is much more frequent and that is not always the same kind of topics. So for instance, because we are such a caring organization and well-being is something that is very important for us, we have twice a year a well-being check-in where we ask specifically only 10 questions about are you feeling well like is the way your workload is it okay for you is your manager demonstrating that he cares for your well-being do you have the right flexibility in the work approach you know like these kind of things we also, because the manager is so important to us, do a manager effectiveness survey where we ask people, so the leadership of your manager, how would you evaluate it so that we have some concrete feedback that we can give to leaders around, hey, your team has said in the last engagement survey that actually their manager is not at the level they want to. Then we ran the manager effectiveness survey and your team again said that you are not asking for feedback, you're not doing this and that. So we're really gathering additional data points so that it's not just one time a year, oh my God, this is not working, but that we really have opportunities to get back to people as well. Because as you know, Kevin, it's not only about asking a question, it's really about, hey, I heard you and this is what I'm taking away from it. And so we are also spending a lot of time, not only surveying, but also feeding back to the organization. This is what we heard, and these are the actions we're going to take on it. So we have, again, these regular check-ins on different topics, short surveys, nothing you know, overwhelming. And currently we, we just ran our annual larger one, 23 questions should be okay. Um, and we're going to take time. We got over, we, we had over 80% participation, wow. you know, shows that people are really engaged. They might not be happy with everything, but they take the time to, an to answer. And we are now working on understanding we have over 3000 comments, you know, mm -hmm. so the verbatim is very important as well doing focus groups to better understand, you know, if in every organization it's the same. We have, of course, some geographical differences. We're trying to better understand that as well. And um, yeah, so very interesting. Uh, again, for listeners, so, so many best practices in here. And definitely, uh, Manuel, you mentioned this trend sort of moving away or supplementing the, the annual survey with, with pulse surveys. I like to see organizations run them quarterly. Some organizations run them monthly, but most but that's a little bit uh, much. And the importance of closing the loop, the fastest way to disengage uh, someone is to ask them to invest their time in this. And then it goes into the black hole and they're like, well, that was a waste of time. Like, did that even matter? And the fact that you highlighted not necessarily your scores, but the participation rate, when we get the data back, it's the first thing I notice. If someone's got 80% or higher, it's like, whoa, super high engagement just based on the number of people who are completing it. If it's low, especially below 50%, it's like there's a psychological safety issue. They don't believe it's confidential or they don't think it's going to matter or they're already disengaged. You know, why would I even do this? Especially if it's uh, confidential. So many good stuff. With, with all these great things that you're doing, is there any one 
unique thing related to culture that you're most proud of? Well, the thing that I'm personally most proud of, I already spoke about, is our full flexible work approach, because I think it demonstrates that we trust our employees, that we trust that they are doing the right thing for the company. And so when I speak with my peers and other companies who are, especially here in Europe, you know, where there is a little bit more of a traditional approach and where there is a little defiance, actually, where it's like, if I don't see you, I'm not sure you're really performing. I always say I'm not managing presence, I'm managing performance. And so we need to make sure we give our managers the tools also to have that, you know, peace of mind to know that it's not because they do not see their employee on a daily basis that it means that um, they are not performing. I would also like to stress that because we are a global organization, it is impossible to see everybody every day. You know, I'm a global leader. I'm not going to see my senior director of people in Tokyo on a weekly basis. You know, I see her over Zoom, but I won't see her in, in the office. So it doesn't really matter to me if she is doing her Zoom call from her home office or from the Tokyo office. Now, the business that she supports in Tokyo might have a different opinion about that. And so I'm going to ask every time I'm asking for feedback about her performance you know, what does the business leader say? Is she present when they need her or do they feel like she's disconnecting? And so this is where we need to find the right balance. But I feel like being in this full flexible approach and not being part of those companies that say you have to come back is making us pretty unique. And I have to say, we've seen it from an attraction and retention perspective. It has helped us attract talent and it has clearly helped us retain talent as well. Yeah, that's that's powerful and and hopefully is going to be a good example and model for a lot of others out there. We only have a few minutes left, but I'm curious, is there a a, a book or even a, a podcast or a movie or anything that you would sort of recommend that your colleagues read? So I'm a big fan of The Culture Code um, by Daniel Coyle. Um, you know, as, as a global citizen, as I said earlier, um, I have a strong um, belief that every company culture is really unique. Uh, but when you add the international component to it, like the fact that you're mixing cultures, um, it's even more powerful. And I think that in, in this book, there is there's great examples, you know, of what can make a company super successful when you understand that culture, but also what can be a derailer and what um, you have to watch out for. So I would say for people who are interested in that aspect, it's a good book. And you know, with with culture always changing and there's you know potential derailers out there and things, is there a particular skill or behavior that right now you you know if you could wave your magic wand, your team members would do more of this, a particular skill or behavior. Anything come to mind? I think that, you know, it, the, the one thing that I personally still continue to be a little bit worried about is, is mental health and well-being overall, you know. And we have put a lot of things in place, like a mental health first aids, like people that volunteered to have a special training to be like an alternative to the manager or the HR person and help people who struggle with mental health. And I would just wish that everybody who has that struggle dares to speak up. You know, we have a lot of, again, we are very open culture and we are, we don't, I wouldn't want to say, oh, nobody has a problem in our company. I can, of course, not talk about who has one, but, um, I can sense that in general, people are still a little bit hesitant. And I would definitely want to make sure that they understand that with everything we do and with everything we, we demonstrate, that they can talk about the fact that there is things happening in their life outside of business, you know, that impact them and that, you know, we have understanding for that. Because I feel like that's what's really defining a caring culture is when you you accept the employee as a whole not only as your employee from nine to five but as the human being that comes to work with their own history personal struggles and whatever i um i know officially when i asked you about culture you talked about open and togetherness and impactful 
to my ears, like the unofficial description of your culture is, is caring. Like that has come through literally in your words and just the tone and the emphasis on the wellness and the pulse surveys. And that's, that's really uh, powerful. So final question um, these days, you know, what's exciting you most about, about Critio? So I think what's super exciting is that we are in a transformation, um, a, a big transformation with regards to how uh, we align our offerings um, to lead actually the next new wave of digital advertising. So there is, we are building a commerce media platform, which will better serve marketers, agencies, retailers, and publishers as they take advantage of all these commerce media advertisement opportunities. There's a big launch that is coming up in, in September. So very excited about that because it is transforming a company that was very strong on what we call um, marketing solutions towards more of how do we support retailers in their journey with regards to advertisement. And so there is technology transformation behind that, but there's also commercial transformation behind that. And the whole organization is really morphing towards um, something that we believe is at the forefront of um, a, a great business opportunity. That's great. Manuela, thanks and uh, congratulations first on all the success that, that you're having and investing, you know, time and efforts with, with your culture. Thanks for sharing so many details with us. Hopefully, it'll uh, I know it will inspire a lot of other chief people officers who are maybe um, just starting out and or trying to get their culture to that next level. So thanks for that as well. Of course. Of course. Maybe a last word just to say that I think I'm very lucky because I'm working with a CEO, Megan Clarken, who not only is a woman, which is very rare um, in tech, but she's also an extremely inclusive uh, DNI leader, which is helping in terms of credibility. You know, for us, we are really living at the leadership level. By example, the fact that it is okay that you are different and that there is something around the reality of the diversity in our organization. And for me as the chief people officer, this is an incredible gift um, because when you don't have to convince your CEO that you have to do this, but when the energy comes from there, it's just great. Well, that's great recognition. Not only is it rare to have um, a, a female CEO of a tech company, but of a publicly traded company as well. It's incredible how the barriers that are still there and how much work that needs to be done. And so I could see, I mean, just her presence alone is sort of inspiring about for the culture that you're trying to create and, and a great representation for, for the world, the world offices. It's fantastic. No, definitely. No, we're small, but mighty. <laughs> I love it. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you. <laughs> and well, thank you again for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Really appreciate it.